Powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. It's a critic of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. All scriptures God breathed is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Therefore, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Turn in the word of truth this evening to Psalm 119. A few announcements. Don't forget tomorrow, uh, Deacon Jim Penn can use as many individuals as possible to help with the painting that's going on in the church. And uh, Jim, raise your hand once again in case someone doesn't know who you are. And uh, please let Jim know whether, whether or not you can actually uh, show up and uh, help us with the painting that has to take place in the church so we can make the house of God look like the house of God should, which is to be the best that we can do, loving God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. This evening, I'd like to announce that we do have a, uh, a couple that is here. They've been very faithful throughout the years. You might, you uh, have heard her name over and over again because she does ask a lot of questions. And her name is Pam Huffman. And uh, Pam is here with her husband, Leonard. Can you please just stand up for a second? All the way from Illinois. Thank you for being here. Actually, they were in the streets of Fall River, and they said, I will work for food. So we said, just make, sure, make believe you're from Illinois. And how do, do we pronounce it? Is it, uh, is it can key? Kanker key, like a canker. Kanker key, all right, that's good. Well, thank you folks for coming here, and we really appreciate you traveling all that way just to be with the royal family. And you know that we are your royal family, like you know that you are our royal family as well. And it's great to have you and your husband to actually dedicate yourself to coming here just to hear the Word of God and just to honor the Word of God as it is alive and powerful, as we just mentioned. So we want to thank you from the bottom of our heart for doing the traveling that you have done. Once again, we also want to take a moment of silent prayer, as we normally do, to give us the opportunity to examine our own lives, which means naming and citing any known sin, if we have any, and also if there's something that might be disturbing or distracting to you. Now is not the time to concentrate on any of your problems or difficulties, but now is the time to give your undivided attention to the Word of God, which is alive and powerful, which God has magnified above His very own name. So therefore, with that in mind, let's take that moment of silent prayer so you can examine your own life and prepare yourself for the most important thing you do in life, which is to study the Word of God. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Let's take that moment of silent prayer right now. Once again, Father, we are grateful and thankful for the opportunity we have to gather together with members of the royal family. We are thankful for those who are here face to face, and we are also grateful for those who are our non-face to face congregation as we gather together, as the Apostle Paul said, with, by means of the Spirit. So we thank you that you've given us this opportunity to grow in your grace and knowledge challenge us through the ministry of God the Holy Spirit, who is our true mentor and our true teacher, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, we have now begun a study. As you know, it's going to take us quite a bit of time, the way things are going, but I love it anyway. But we now have begun a study in Psalm 119, which is known as an acrostic psalm. And there is more than just Psalm 119. There's about over 10, maybe almost 12 acrostic psalms found in the Word of God. What is an acrostic psalm? An acrostic psalm is simply a filing system that the Jews developed from the ancient Hebrew alphabet with every letter from their alphabet having a special significance and meaning. And that's exactly what we have been noting with the first eight verses of Psalm 119. This simply 
means that the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet has a meaning. The first letter is the, uh, the letter is Aleph, looks like that in the Hebrew, and Aleph meant to the Jews, it represented an ox, it meant to the Jews some form of prosperity. So every verse in verses 1 through 8 begins with this letter Aleph, and to them it meant that the following verses, or the verse that uh, is actually quoted has to do with representing an ox, and it signifies prosperity as found in the Word of God, mentioned in Psalm 119, 1 through 8. On Sunday morning, we'll be dealing with the second letter, which is called Beth, B-E-T-H, and that's equivalent to R-B, and that has eight verses that fall under the principle of what Beth actually means. And so in Psalm 119, we've already covered the eight, first eight verses, not in detail. We're going to begin that this evening and conclude that this evening. The first eight verses of Psalm 119, 1 through 8, all begin with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it meant to the Jews, again, whenever they saw that first letter, it said, this is the prosperity file. It was known as the letter Aleph, and that's equivalent to our letter A in the English alphabet. Now, what did that mean? That meant that simply that when you looked at Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8, the first word that you see in the verse, and every verse begins with that letter Aleph. Here we have Aleph, we don't have Aleph, but we have the word for happiness, or blessings. In fact, Aleph looks like this, as I just mentioned to you. It's in the plural, and therefore it means blessings or happinesses. It's the word asherai, S-A-A-S-H-E-R-I. That's the first letter or the first word in Psalm 119, verse 1. It's a reference to how you can have blessings if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, or how you can have happinesses, because it's in the plural, it refers to both inner and overt blessings or overt forms of happiness. And so the Jew, to the Jews, when they said, when they saw that letter Aleph, they said those next eight letters or the next eight verses will actually tell us how to prosper. It is in the plural and therefore it means blessings, not blessing or blessed, or happinesses, not happy, but happinesses, referring to both inner or overt blessings or overt forms of happiness. And so because of the olive, that this is the file of prosperity, all the eight verses we will see as we close this evening, all the eight verses have to do with how you can prosper as a believer. And the olive is a file that represents prosperity. All eight verses in Psalm 119, 1 through 8 tells us how can a believer prosper? How can a believer prosper? And so we begin in Psalm 119 on verse 1. It begins by saying again, Asherah. It begins by saying Asherah in the plural does not mean blessed. You know, a lot of times people say, uh, hear that word blessed. They just think it's just a word. They don't understand that in the plural it doesn't mean blessed. It means blessings or happinesses belong to certain individuals. And who are the individuals? that it belongs to, we're going to see they are the ones who, are, who have positive volition to a doctrine. Now, if you look at Psalm 119, verse 1, it says, blessings or happinesses belong to the person whose way is what? Blameless. We've already noted that as the corrected translation, which doesn't say their way is blessed or blameless. It actually says that they actually have a, a life that belongs to those whose way is not really blameless, but the word blameless means those who are equipped. If you are equipped with the word of God, the promise is you will be blessed by God. And so the word blameless, as we've already noted, means to be equipped. And what are they equipped for? Or how do you know that they are equipped? Look at the remainder of the verse. Happinesses or blessings belong to those who are equipped, who walk in what? They walk in what? The law. You have that word law. A lot of times people think the word law means the uh, Ten Commandments. And it does mean that, but it goes way beyond that. The word law is actually the Hebrew word Torah. And Torah is one of the titles for the Word of God. The word Torah does not refer to the Ten Commandments only. It refers to that which directs 
guides and aims us toward a way of life resulting in God's divine nature in human vessels. Think about this. You have the opportunity of having the nature of God alive in you. Why? Aleph, uh, Aleph says you can have prosperity because Torah, if you walk in the Torah of the Lord, that aims you toward a place where your way of life results in the divine nature of God in your human vessel. Or what I've been teaching is the principle of the Andric action. Now, by the way, that's something we're going to spend a lot of time on coming up in the future. What is the Andric action? The Andric action refers to the action of God's nature controlling a believer who has the humility revealed by the fact that they walk in the Torah of God. The Andric action is made up of two words, theos, and then anthropos, God, Dios, anthropos is man. It means that God is alive in man. God is alive in your life. So the entry action actually refers to the action of God's nature controlling you. And as a believer, it controls you, and you have the humility revealed by the fact that you don't just have it one time. What does the Bible say in verse 1? You walk in the action of God. You walk in the Torah of God. So again, the Indric action actually, actually can be translated like this in Psalm 119.1. Blessings or happinesses belong to those whose way is not blameless, because all of us fail every day, don't we? Say amen, Pastor. We do. Oh, yeah. Thank you, David. We all fail. But blessings or happinesses belong to those whose way is equipped and who walk in the Torah or the, God, or the, the Word of God, the Torah, or what I've, to, I've I showed you. It means the governmental doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ. It means that the power of God, the Holy Spirit, is alive in you as well as the Word of God, which is alive in what? Powerful. It gives you past. It gives you uh, power. So an amplified translation simply re reveals this: that you can have blessings, you can have happinesses if your way is equipped with walking in the, the law or the governmental doctrine of the Word of God. And that led us to the second verse. Look at Psalm 119, verse two. Psalm 119, 2 again says, blessings or happinesses, again the word is blessed, it's asherah in the plural. So we have to say blessings or happinesses belong to those who observe his what? Testimonies. Now what does the word testimony mean? Why do we have statues? Why do we have commandments? Why do we have uh, the, the word of God? Why do we have different manifestations of God's word? Because they all mean something different. And we have to know exactly what they, those things actually mean. So in Psalm 119, 2, it says, Blessings or happinesses belong to those who observe his testimonies. Now again, if you look at verse 2, the first word in the sentence begins with an olive. There it is again. All eight verses in Psalm 119, 1 through 8, begin with the letter Aleph, and it's the word Asherah, A-S-H-E-R-I, in the plural, and it means blessings or happinesses, referring to both the inner and the overt manifestations of happiness or blessings that belong to you. And this times it belongs to certain individuals. Notice what it says, it says next. To those who observe God's testimonies, to those who seek him with all of their heart. And what is it that they uh, actually observe? They actually observe his testimonies. The word for testimonies is not an olive there because of the fact that uh, the olive has already been given in verse 2. But the word for testimonies is the Hebrew noun edah, E-D-A-H. It's derived from a word which signifies happiness belongs to those who testify to be a witness of God's word in action. Let me show you something. Go to the book of Acts for a moment. Look at Acts chapter 1 in verse 8. If you want to give glory to God, here's how you're going to be able to do it. If you want to be faithful to him and faithful in his word. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is a prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled but will be fulfilled when the church age begins. 
Here's what the uh, Apostle Peter actually told the early Christians. He said in Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, he said, But you will receive what? Power. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And that power will cause you, you shall be my what? Witnesses, that's the word testimony right there. You're going to testify that God's word is true by the way that you live, you see. People observe your life. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, in verses 1 through 3, that you are a walking epistle, and that whether you know it or not, people are observing your life. And so Acts 1.8 says, again, you will receive power. This did not take place as of yet when it was written. It does take place in Acts chapter 2, but it says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and that power will cause you to be my witnesses. You know what the word witnesses actually is? It comes from the word martyr, and it means that you are one that's willing to die for that which you believe, martyrdom. And it says you'll be witnesses, first of all, both in Jerusalem, notice this, and then all Judea, and then Samaria, and then even to the remotest part of the earth. Why is that important? Because the first form of power that you're going to receive is going to be manifested in Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem first? That's the place that crucified our Lord. So the Lord starts off with the worst place that crucified, crucified him. So you're going to receive power in both Jerusalem. The most wicked place of all was Jerusalem because that's where Christ was actually martyred or killed. And then it says, and then in all Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria were half Jews and half Samaritans. And then after that, you're going to receive power in the, to be a witness to me in the remotest part of the earth. So here's what we have. We have, first of all, your life is going to be able to glorify God in Jerusalem, the worst place of all. God starts out with the worst. Then he says, and then you go from there to those who are half Jewish and those who are half Gentiles called the Samaritans. And then you go from there to the uttermost part of the earth. God starts out with the worst place of all to say, if I can have myself glorified or you can glorify my son in the worst time of your life, in the worst areas of your life, it follows that principle of what we call a fortiori, if God does the greater, he can do the lesser. If you can glorify God in Jerusalem, the worst time of your life, and then you can glorify God in, in, the Samar in Samaria, those, that, those times that are half Jews and those times that are half Gentiles, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. What is that saying? You can glorify God in any situation that you are involved in. So in Psalm 119, verse 2, again, the first word in the sentence is what we call in the imperfect tense, by the way. The imperfect tense of that verb, Allah, so uh, that verb uh, that begins with Aleph, the imperfect tense means that there's not going. There's going to be times where you keep on having certain points of time. In other words, the aorist tense says you do it one time. The imperfect tense does, says this. It's not like the present tense. The present tense says you live like that habitually. The imperfect tense says this. You keep on having points of time where you can glorify God. How many of you have gone through certain situations where you have had points of time where you could glorify God? You don't do it all the time because none of us are perfect. But you do have in the imperfect tense certain points of time that no matter what you go through, and this psalm went through a lot of disasters. No matter what you go through, you, are, you end up glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love how it says, and by the way, how it says that this happiness belongs to those who observe his testimonies. You see, if you observe the testimonies of God, it means you're dedicated to that. That's how you live. To observe God's testimonies means that you keep on seeking those doctrines that cause you to be a witness for him. How many of you want to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? I do. 
You don't do it by coming to church once in a while. You do it by remaining faithful, having in the imperfect tense points of time. You go through a problem in the marriage, a problem with the family, a problem in the social life, a problem on your job. You go through certain problems, but what you do is you don't quit. You keep on going through those problems and you become a modern a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You are observing his testimonies. And I love that because that's what Psalm 119 verse 2 is actually saying. It says, blessings or happinesses belong to those who observe God's testimonies. And not only that, not only do they observe the testimonies of God, they don't stop there. What, are they, what else do they do? They keep on what? Seeking him how? with all of their heart. And I love that because that's how we glorify God. To truly worship God, one must seek after him continually with all their heart and understanding that none of us ever really arrive. We are constantly growing. Has God ever revealed to you that no matter what you go through, you can't get yourself out of the situation? You're weak, and if it's not for him, you'd never go through the situation. That's what God does on a consistent basis. And so therefore, I like what Jeremiah said and how he put it in Jeremiah 29, verse 13, where he tells us about those who worship God. He says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with what? All of your heart. All of your heart. That means all your mind, all your soul, and all of your strength. And so the first word that comes up now is the word also. Look at the next verse where the word of God actually teaches, blessings or happiness belong to those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all of their heart, okay? And then we have verse 3. The first word in the original language is the word, all is the word, well, we don't have it on the board, is, is actually the word, um, where is it? It's the word up. But it looks like this in the, that shouldn't be there right there, so bear with me with some of these Hebrew uh, um, fonts. But the first word is this right here, also. It actually means that also, not only do they seek God with all of their heart, they do not walk in unrighteousness. What is it that they walk in? They walk in his ways. They keep on going in spite of the obstacles that are placed in their path. How many of you have obstacles that are constantly placed in your path? I do. I see it over and over again. I see every time I try to go forward in the plan of God, here comes another obstacle that's unexpected. What are you going to do? Here's what Peter said. He said this to the Lord. When the Lord said, are you also going to reject me? And Peter said, where else can I go? Who else has the words of what? Eternal life. There's only one way to go. Isaiah put it like this in Isaiah 57, 14. It shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way. Remove every obstacle out of the way of my people. That was the prayer that Isaiah actually gave the children of Israel, and that's what God wanted the children of Israel to pray. Tell God or ask God, remove every obstacle out of your way. You are the people of God. Don't let those obstacles get the best of you. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 2.18. He said, I would have been able to come to you, but Satan hindered me. Now what happens when the kingdom of darkness hinders you? I'll tell you what happens. You have a choice. Either keep going forward in the plan of God or quit and throw in the tile. Uh, the towel. And that's why I love in Psalm 119.3, it doesn't say they also. The first word is also. Why? That's the word Aleph. That's the letter Aleph. Also, they do not do unrighteousness. They walk in God's ways. Satan and the kingdom of darkness works overtime to try to convince you and I that we can handle the problems on our own. We cannot. We have to walk, notice what the word says, walk in whose ways? 
his ways. Ways simply refers to God's ways or doctrine governing their behavior pattern or our behavior pattern. And then we read in verse 4, you have ordained your precepts. Notice verse 4. You have ordained your precepts that we should walk or we should keep them diligently. In verse 4, the first word begins with the word ata. A-T-A-A-H. Again, notice what does it begin with? What letter? Aleph. It's still under the Aleph file. And it's translated thou. And the first letter is Aleph. And it simply says, under the Aleph file, you have to realize that God has ordained your life. If God has ordained your life, and he has, and if God's ways are perfect, and they are, then what do you have to fear about? Absolutely nothing then why do we fear lack of faith? Remember what the writer said? Go to Hebrews chapter 11 for a moment. Look at verses 1 and 6. Are you having a good time tonight? Where else to be then with the children of God? You still have time to enjoy the rest of the evening, don't you? But what better place to be than with God's people? What does Hebrews 11 say in verse 1, where the writer actually says, and we still, like Psalm 119, we don't know who the, writer, who the author of Psalm 119 is, but we don't know who the author of Hebrews is either. But in Hebrews chapter 11, it says in verse 1 what faith is all about. It says, now faith is the assurance. Is faith something like a hope? No. Faith is the assurance of things that are hoped for. But faith is the what? Conviction of things not seen. And therefore, if I'm going to live in the conviction of things not seen, then I have to come up with verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please who? Him. For he who, who, he who comes to God must believe that God is. Notice, if you come to God, you must believe that God is who he says that he is. And that he is a rewarder of who? Those who seek him. The Greek says, those who diligently seek for him. And so back to Psalm 119, look at verse 4 once again. Because we're finishing the olive file this evening. I don't care if I have to uh, to let you stay at 9 o'clock. We're getting this done so we can go with the Beth file on Sunday morning. But Psalm 119.4, we read once again, Thou has ordained thy precepts. Again, the first word is ata'a. It means, that begins with an aleph, and it says, you have done something for us. You ordain. Ordain is the Hebrew word tasa, taswa, T-S-A-W-H. The only way to, for me to teach you the word of God is to tell you what the original language has to say. So if you're visiting here this evening, or if you're not used to this type of teaching, it might be strange to you, but the only way I can tell you what the word of God is saying is to tell you what the original language says when it was written. Ordain is the Hebrew word taswa. It means to decree. God has decreed something in your life. It means to appoint. God has appointed whatever you're going through. God has appointed that in your life. It means to set in order a plan with a command. Really what it means is that God has everything under control. Amen to that? This means God has ordained us. He's designed us to live in his plan for our life. Therefore, if you want to prosper, because what file are we noting? The What kind of file? The olive file, which is what? The prosperity file. If you want to prosper, you must learn the fact that God has a plan for your life. All he wants you to do is Psalm 46, verse 10, which says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know I am in God. But wait a minute, God, I'm going through this right now, and I don't like the way things are turning out. Shut up, be still, and know I'm God. Moses said that in Exodus 14, 13 and 14. He told the people of Israel, be still, shut up, and watch the deliverance of the Lord. What we all need to do is learn to be still and shut up, don't we? I mean, that's a great principle. I mean, I don't want you men to take advantage of that and tell your lady tonight, be still and shut up. That would be the McLaughlin translation, but that's why I don't have a lady, so anyway, it doesn't matter. But the point is, be still and know that he is God. 
And so when it says that he has ordained us, it is what is known, now notice again, the word ordained is very interesting. It's what is known as a word, a verb that's what is called in the PL stem. Why is that important? Because in the Hebrew, you have the same thing you have in the Greek. The tenses mean something. The PL stem is what we call a stem in the intensive way. It means that this is very, very important for us to understand. It's intense for us to understand. The intensive stem in the Hebrew, which is the verb sava, means to appoint, to assign, or to elect, or to choose. It's saying God has appointed you. God has assigned you. You. God has elected you. God has chosen you. So be still. Know that he's God. He's got everything under control, even when it seems that he doesn't. Amen to that? And so he has ordained us. Billions and billions of years ago, think about it, friends, God has ordained, God has designed a solution to all of our disasters. Are you listening? Again, billions and billions of years ago, you've heard it many times before, but God has ordained or designed a solution to all of our disasters. That's why no disaster is too great for what? The plan of God. He's got everything under control. And I like how he says that you have commanded or ordained us. Psalm 119.4 would look like this in the Amplified Translation. Thou has commanded or thou has ordained or ordered us. And what has God done? He's ordered us to relax and to rest. And that's why I love what he says. He says something very interesting. Since we're in the book of Psalms, look at Psalm 37. It's always been another passage that I love in the book of Psalms, one of my favorite ones. You'll see why in just a moment. But look at Psalm 37, 23. It puts it like this. It says, the steps of a man. But this time, the word for man is not the normal word. The word is aner, A-N-E-R. It means a noble man. Let me repeat that. We don't have time to go into all the Hebrew, but again, it says, the steps of a man, the word man is on air. Look it up for yourself online if you want to. You can study these things even online. The word is A-N-E-R. It means the steps of an adult man are established by the Lord. And notice this, and he delights in his way. He, God the Father, delights in his way. You, as a believer, you and I. Notice what it says again. The steps of a man, a mature man, are established by the Lord, and he, the Father, delights in his way, the man's way. Notice the next word. What is the next word in the chapter, in the, in the verse? What does it say? Next word. When. when. Does it say if? No, does it? It doesn't say if, does it? It says when he what? He falls. Do you know what that tells us? We are going to fall. Get used to it. You can't overcome this. You're going to fall. So am I. And it doesn't say if we fall, we shall not be hurled or headlong. It says when we fall. He shall not be hurled headlong. Why? Because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. What does that tell us? That tells us that when we do fall, and we will, we've got someone holding our hand. Back to Psalm 119, verse 4. Now you can see why I'm about to say what I am, which says, Thou hast ordained your precepts. Notice the word precepts, one of the eight words used for the word of God in this psalm. Psalm 119.4. Are you there yet? You don't have to go that far. It's only a few chapters. Psalm 119.4, you have ordained your precepts. The word precepts, again, is one of the eight words used for the word of God in this psalm, and it refers to categorical doctrine. The word is picudim, and picudim, it's, this is the original language word, P-I-Q-Q-U-D-I-M. It's used 21 times in Psalm 119. It's used as a verb or as an individual who is an officer or overseer, and it refers to categorical doctrine 
doctrines given by one in authority, namely God. What is it saying? That God has given you certain precepts. God has given you his word. God is your officer. God is your overseer. God has categorical doctrines for you to live by. It's given by God. And if God gives it, he must supply what you need to overcome it. Faithful, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24, faithful is the one who calls you who will also perform that which he has appointed you to do. God never tells us to do something without giving us the ability and the power to do so. So the writer is saying in Psalm 119, he's saying this, you have ordained or you have ordered us to God, that's what the word means, to protect, to utilize doctrine that we are to seek diligently, which means we are to seek it PL stem. What's the PL stem? The intensive stem, we are to seek it intensively, excessively, repeatedly. In other words, we're to do it with all of our what? Heart. Can you see how important it is to go back to the original language? You have ordained God. You have ordered us to God, protect, utilize doctrine. We're to seek it diligently, intensively, excessively, repeatedly with all of our heart. Remember what we are doing now, which is what? We're gathering together to study the word of God. Amen? Which is what? A command from God Almighty, from the throne room of God. We're to study God's word. We're told, by the way, do you realize this? This has always been one book I've always wanted to be entered into. We, every time we gather together, the Bible says there's a name, there's a date, there's a year that's recorded for every time you've gathered together. Those who respected or revered the Lord spoke to one another, the Lord gave attention and heard it, and a book of what? Remembrance was written before him for those who respected the Lord and who esteemed his name. So why some people find it more important for them to stay at home and watch some idiotic TV show or some form of athletic uh, show, whatever it is that they're doing, the Bible says there's a book of remembrance written down that says in the year of our Lord Jesus Christ, in June 25th, is that it? June 26th, in the year 2015, Dave was here, and his name is recorded in the Book of Life. What about Joe? Well, he was too busy. He was dating uh, Harry. Oh, no, Joe can't date Harry. <laughs> he, he, was, he was dating someone else. He was dating someone else. But you know what? I love that Malachi 3.16. That's true prosperity. Remember, true prosperity is what we're studying. Psalm 119.5, look at verse 5. It tells us about the psalmist and his desire and the prosperity that comes from the, from the true desires of the heart. It says, Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your what? Statues. By the way, the word oh that, notice what it is. You would never say that that word is, begins with an A. It doesn't sound like that, does it? Oh, that, the first word is ahay, A-H-A-A-Y. It be, looks like this. You go from right to left in the Hebrew. The first letter is the letter what? Aleph, under the Aleph file. Notice our ways need to be directed and established, not by the man of the house, not by someone else, not by the pastor, but by God, and it's called his statues. Man constantly needs the direction of God the Holy Spirit to keep his word. Why? Why do we need God the Holy Spirit? Why, why is it that we need God the Holy Spirit to help us keep his word? Let me show you why. Go to Isaiah 1, 5, and 6. I've always loved this verse. It reminds us of who and what we really are. Isaiah 1, 5. Go there quickly. We've got 20 minutes left. Notice what verse 5 says, and it talks about mankind and the condition that mankind is in without God. He puts it like this in Isaiah 1.5, where will you be stricken again? What does that mean? That we are stricken in some ways. Where will you be stricken again? As you continue in your what? Rebellion. The whole head is Say it with me, sick. 
the whole heart is faint. The Lord is saying to the prophet Isaiah, why bother even trying to do anything with you when you just have a bullheaded way of doing things? You keep beating your heads against a brick wall. Everything within you protests against you and has nothing to do with the plan of God. And then I like, look at verse 6. From the sole of the feet, the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is nothing sound where? In it. Think about that. From the top of my head, to the bottom of my, my feet, there's nothing sound in me. So why are, you, why are you judging me for not being sound? Is there anything sound in you? Look at your head sometimes. Don't look at my head, look at your head. Don't look at my feet, look at your feet. The Bible says from the top of our head to the sole of our feet, there's nothing sound in it. There's only bruises because of mistakes we've made. There's welts which has to do with all kinds of hurt that comes out of making wrong decisions. There's raw wounds, we're still wounded. Not pressed out, not bandaged, nor softened with oil. Why? Because the whole head is sick, the whole heart is deceitful. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17:5, your head is so sick and your heart is deceitfully wicked. From the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, nothing's working right. But there's a prosperity file to make it work right. There are wounds and bruises and running sores in our head, untended, unwashed, and unbandaged. But what happens? God, the Holy Spirit, directs and empowers us so that human failures can be transformed into what? Victories for the believer who is courageous in his faith and keeps going forward. Back to Psalm 119 as we close in verse 5. It says, oh, that my ways may be established. I'm going to give you time to get there. Oh, the psalmist says, and remember, he's taken into slavery, and he's going to Babylon, and he's going to be taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, oh, that my ways may be established. I wish my ways were more stable to keep thy statues. Notice the word statues. Another description of God's word in this psalm is called statues. The word, the Hebrew word is kukim, H-U-Q-I-M. It's used 21 times. It's derived from the root verb to mean to engrave, to inscribe. The idea is of the written word of God and the authority of his written word being inside of your soul. And he said, I'm going to follow your statues. Every form, every time he uses the phrase for the word of God, he uses some form of definition that has to do with a different definition than others. He said, oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statues. That's my pros prosperity file. If my ways would only be established to keep your statues. Verse 6, then if my ways were established to keep your statues, then I shall not be what? What does it say? Ashamed. And that word is bosh. B-A-W-S-H. I shall no longer be confused or embarrassed. Have you ever been confused or embarrassed? People have said things that you did and you say, I never did that, but you did do it, but you just were confused and embarrassed. You don't remember or you don't want to. He says, I wish my ways, oh, again, he says, I shall not be ashamed. I don't want to be confused. I don't want to be embarrassed. More people are confused as Christians than not. The word for look, notice what it says, I shall not be ashamed when I what look. It's the Hebrew word nabat, N-A-B-A-T. It actually means, it actually means to look at something with respect and with pleasure and not to be influenced by the old sin nature or the emotions. Don't let your emotions get the best of you. You know how many times we've all gotten in trouble because of the emotions? You were in love on Friday night, weren't you? <laughs> but then Saturday morning came and you said, where are my socks? Yeah, a few people that said that, I know where you're coming from. Some did not say that, but I know their hearts. They were guilty of that. They just don't want to laugh and make you think that they are guilty of that. We've all gone through what I call the where are my socks syndrome. In other words, why did I screw up the night before? Why? Sick head from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. We're normal individuals that need help from the divine authority of our Lord and Savior. And so the response of the emotions indicate the condition of the mind, not the spirit. 
the response of the emotion, the response of the emotions indicate that there's problems going on in what we think, not in our human spirit. And that right attitude toward doctrine is this. I love it. Do you love the word of God this evening? Do you? Do you? Say amen. amen. I love it. The right attitude toward doctrine, I love it now, and I want to be converted into divine energy to bring glory to God. And notice what he says right now. He noticed the word now. Another word's coming up. I shall not be ashamed when I look upon thy what? Commandments. Another word. You see, he's covering all parts of the word of God. Mitzvah. M-I-T-Z-V-A-H. In the word of God, Psalm 119. Used 22 times. Emphasizes the straight authority of what is said or the divine orders that come from God. Then as I mentioned, one of my favorite verses is mentioned in verse 7. Look at it. I shall give thanks. One translation says, I shall give praise to thee with uprightness of heart, with a heart filled with character and integrity. When will we give thanks to God with an uprightness of heart? When I, what's the next word? Learn. What you're doing right now, you're giving praise to God. We give thanks to God when we learn his word. This is how the infinite God can relate to finite man. And notice we praise God when we learn what kind of judgments. Not judgments, but what kind of judgments. His righteous judgments. I love the verb for learn. It's the verb lamad, L-A-M-A-D. It means to learn the hard way. How many have ever learned the hard way? And how many would like to learn the hard way? <laughs> That's great. I love you guys. That's good. The word, again, means to learn the hard way. The olive says, to what? Prosper. How can you prosper even when you learn the hard way? It simply means, do you ever think you could praise God by simply doing what you're doing right now? learning the word of God. It means we have the ability to learn God's righteous judgments even though we're going through the experience of failure. And the word judgments is the word mispatim, used 23 times, M-I-S-P-A-T-I-M. You can see I've done a lot of studying on all these words. It reveals the rules by which we should be regulated by and cause us to discern what is right and what is wrong and decide accordingly. We're learning God's judgments. Why'd you do this, God? Because I needed to do this in your life to wake you up as to what is true. And he's not condemning us, he's waking us up. Amen to that? In other words, God, you know, when we learn God's righteous judgments, we give praise to God. In other words, God can say to Satan, notice this now, very important, this applies to some people that are missing, especially here this evening. God can say to Satan, look, Satan, they're worshiping me. They're praising me. When they what? Learn. Look, Satan. Look at these people at Grace Bible Church tonight. Look at these people that traveled all the way from Illinois to be under the teaching of the word of God. Look, Satan. They're giving me praise because they're here to learn. The sad thing is, on the other hand, Satan can say, well, the opposite is there are those who don't learn. There's something more important to them than the word of God. Finally, I shall keep your statues. Do not forsake me utterly. He's not going to be forsaken. He's just saying to God, I want to go forward in your plan. I'm in the slave chain gang right now. I'm going to Babylon, but I'm going to forsake. I'm not going to forsake your word. I'll keep your statues. Do not forsake me utterly. The point is that the writer of Psalm 119 is saying he can still learn. Think about this. I can still learn when I'm going through undeserved suffering. In other words, I will not live in the effects of fallen man, expressing my old sin nature when I go through deserved suffering or even if it's undeserved suffering. Because one way or the other, the suffering we go through is either deserved or undeserved. And this writer is saying, I'm alive. I want to learn more of your wisdom. And notice he did not say, I wish I was what? Dead. You've heard that. 
He wants to live long enough to see God's grace under maximum adversity. That's how he lives in resurrection life, and that's what the prosperity file is all about. So, let's close now. Look at Psalm 119. Let's begin with verse 1. He's making this statement. If doctrine governs your life and you walk in the law or the doctrine of the Lord, you'll fulfill the what? Ways of the Lord. In verse 2, here's how to prosper. If you observe his testimonies and seek him with all of your heart, you will prosper. In verse 3, if you don't rely on your righteousness but rely on God's righteousness, as you walk in his ways, you're going to prosper. In verse 4, if you realize God has ordained his precepts, his categorical doctrines, and he's ordained you to keep them diligently, you will prosper. In verse 5, if your ways become established, you keep his statutes, you will prosper. In verse 6, if you make decisions that do not embarrass yourself, and if they do, you look upon his commands and go forward and rebound and recover, you will prosper. In verse 7, if you give thanks to God with an uprightness of heart or a heart with integrity and learn his righteous judgments, you will prosper. And finally, in the prosperity file in verse 8, if you keep God's statutes and believe that God will not forsake them, you will what? Prosper. And that's because you have understood that principle of the andric action. God is alive in you, and his nature wants to pull you through. And he's not a respecter of persons, says Acts 10.34, but he loves and honors those who are faithful in his word, no matter what it is that they go through. This is only the olive file. Can you imagine what more we have coming in the next 21 files? Because there are 21 more files that we will study and that will give God the ultimate glory that he always deserves. Father, thank you for the ability to gather together with your people. Thank you for those who are here in our congregation this evening, the face-to-face -face congregation, our non-face-to-face -face congregation. We are grateful for the visitors that have traveled all the way from Illinois to be with us. Thank you for that. And thank you for the power of Bible doctrine that gives us the ability to handle any problem that life may bring. Challenge us with what we've heard this evening, for we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we do pray. Amen.